Hey folks, my name is Kevin and it's time for a little bit more knife nerdery and I am dangerously excited. I am as excited to open this box as I was to open this box. And yeah, this is a freaking rosy. And I have this out in part because I think it's actually going to be pretty darn comparable in terms of just kind of general specs, dimensions, quality. It's right in the exact same price range. The big difference is that this is super hype and this is kind of something that no one really knows about. Uh, it's not that no one knows about it, but I don't think, I just, I just don't think that many people really know that this knife exists. I am almost, ex I'm actually, I'm probably about as excited to open this up as I was to open this up. And this is a freaking Peter Rezenti. And the thing is, I own a couple of knives at this point that, that people would call custom knives. Maybe, maybe more than a couple. I own a fair number of knives that people would consider custom knives. But even this, was not custom made for me. What's in here, part of the reason I'm so excited to open it up is this is my first time actually having a customized for me, I picked the specs custom knife made. Ooh, I, it's kind of a weird knife. It's kind of an out there knife. And I used that kind of opportunity to make something that is also kind of weird. We'll, we'll take a look at what's, what I chose. And I definitely chose something that I don't think is going to be the most like, approachable period. I picked color that people don't typically go for. I picked a handle pattern that people might not go for, but I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I'm so dangerously excited to check this out. Okay. I think I'm going to open this up from the bottom even. Uh, just let's, let's see what is inside here. Man, I'm scared. There are more layers of tape than I realized. Finally. That has my mailing address and everything on it. <laughs> oh, there's a handwritten note. What does this say? I am always changing and improving things based on feedback. Please let me know if anything pops up. Uh, the tone of the green can be changed via WD-40 or dish soap and water. It's coming to you as clean, but with normal finger oils, it'll retain its current look. Oh, but with normal finger oils, it'll retain its current look. Uh, WD-40 makes a darker, more jungle green, while dish soap will make it more vibrant. Thanks for your patience, John. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so freaking excited for this. <clears throat> right there, it kind of tells you something I, like, about one of the spec things I chose. I chose green. Ho ho ho, gay. Triaxis. Have you heard of them? Man. Oh, got a little sticker. Heard you like boxes. We put a box inside the box. Okay, right off the bat, I think this is incredibly cool. So this is a laser cut wooden box made by Woodchuck USA. So made in the USA box. And this is the most, I mean, no one else has a box like this. And he was originally shipping these in one of those kind of clamshelly cases. And I think that makes a lot of sense too. Um, but that a, a fair number of people use that and no, no one's doing anything like this. So this definitely makes it feel even more unique and special. And it's just really cool seeing their logo there. <laughs> okay. So this is the Triaxis Midnight Lucky Number 13 in 20 CV, and we'll go through all of these specs as we go. <laughs> oh my God, that's freaking cool. We will get to why he ships a, a, uh, in a screwdriver at some point, but yes, it comes with a Wea T8 screwdriver. Oh my God, this is so lightweight. Oh, look at this. Okay, so right off the bat, one of the things is this knife looks kind of weird because of the way that this comes in like this. It has an odd look, especially when it's in the closed position. It looks almost like the blade to handle ratio is off, but the handle, if you look, the blade is actually all the way up to there. It's just the way this extends down. But then, oh my God, I'm so freaking, how's the detent on that? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look how freaking cool this is. Oh my God. Okay, how does this fit in my hand? And then if I choke up, oh, this is such a cool, weird, oh my God. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Oh my. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so what the heck is this? <laughs> Uh, wow. Um, yeah. Okay. So triaxis is 
the name of a guy, uh, the the name of the knife company by a guy named John Boggs, Jonathan Boggs. I don't know how he wants to go by. Um, he is man. I don't know. Maybe how do I want to how do I want to tell this story? So Jonathan Boggs is a, a like a pretty young guy. I think he's in his mid twenties at latest, and he is. Um, just a huge freaking nerd and exactly my kind of knife maker. He is a super small details, hyper nerd perfectionist person. And it is this. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me, let me back up. I went from never having heard of this guy to buying a $740 book spot from him, which was a money upfront book spot within two hours of, of knowing that he existed. And I can tell you right off the bat, I am just so freaking glad already that I did. But it is also this, oh my God, there's this delightful kind of coincidence. This knife is called The Midnight, and I learned about Jonathan Boggs at, coincidentally, exactly midnight. And so it all just kind of felt like a wonderful kind of Oh, I'm going to suck at that, aren't I? Oh, I'm so bad at that. Okay. Um, it just felt like a wonderful kind of uh, coincidence of, of, of details and timing. Um, I learned about this guy from Alex Steingreiber. So Alex Steingreiber has a, had in his story a link to the fact that, a link to a story that John put up about opening up midnight spots. He already made 10 knives at that point, um, and he had, he was opening up two uh, book spots for the month of May, basically, or April. I don't know exactly how that coincided. Mid-April, that kind of time frame. And like I said, I've never even heard of this guy, but I then went through and and uh, dug through all of his uh, Instagram and YouTube, and he has two different Instagram accounts because he has his personal Instagram account, and then he has the, 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 uh, the company one for this. And it's one of those things where I immediately knew that this was exactly my kind of knife maker. And I immediately knew this was exactly my kind of knife because he's the type of person that does all of that super, super small detail nerding out and shares all of it. He shares this entire journey. You can see all of the inside behind the scenes making all of the, um, the, the way the, the, like the, inside internals of everything, how he designed everything. It's exactly the kind of mega nerd that I love. And so I just fell in love with it immediately. And I was sitting there at two o'clock in the morning going, am I really going to do this? Am I really going to buy this? And then I, I just kind of looked at the, I, I like clicked on the configurator because one of the things he did to do the book spot thing is that he opened up this configurator tool where you could go select through. And I went through and I selected all of the different options and I was looking at it. Uh, and what I selected, I just went, I have to. <laughs> and so I, I bought it. And oh man, everything about this is so freaking me. <sighs> okay. Yeah. So John Boggs is a young guy. Like I said, he is a machinist. He got his, he learned machining while being in the international guard. He was one of the people that worked in their fabrication shop. There is a really wonderful, uh, there's a really wonderful podcast called uh, within tolerances. And he has an episode, he's episode 88. If you want to hear a, a wonderful full explanation of his like backstory, how he came to get into all this stuff, how he just like thinks about this stuff. I, I love, he's really fun to hear talk because he has a great speaking style, but he's also like, I, he, he's fun for me to listen to. He's the type of person, I'm the type of person that wants to hear all of the long rambly details. And he does it in this way that is very captivating, compelling. I love it, love it, love it. Go listen to that podcast. But yeah, he got his whole, his whole machining start in, in the National Guard. And then at some point decided to leave that and, and start a knife company full time. And this isn't his first knife. I forget the, uh, I think it's called the Iris was the first knife that he designed sometime about a year ago. And, um, and he took all of his learnings from that. He didn't make very many of those. Uh, I think maybe like maybe 10 of them. He took all his learnings from that and turned it into this design. And what we have up here is a, I don't really know what you'd call this kind of, kind of sheep's footy, kind of drop pointy, kind of a lot of different things he crazy blade one of the things that makes this knife look kind of wild is this crazy blade shape to me it immediately reminded me of the quote-unquote sheep's foot blade option on the um olamic whippersnapper and the thing is is i spent 
the last year plus looking for the right config of a whippersnapper in the sheep's foot blade because of how much I loved having that blade shape when I, oh man, I, holy crap, I'm just realizing right now that I never uploaded that video. I have a full, I've already filmed an entire full long small decent review, details review, bleh, I can't talk, small details review and comparison of the Olamic Busker and both whippersnapper versions, the uh, sheep's foot and the Warncliffe and one in the frame lock and one in the um, bolster lock and I just haven't edited it. But after trying that sheep's version, I knew I wanted that. The problem with those is that they're not good slicers. And so the entire time that I was thinking I was going to get one, I was thinking that I would have it, uh, I would have it reground once I got it in to be a thinner, maybe even hollow ground knife and something to be a good slicer. And so when I saw this and the, it has the exact same kind of qualities I would want out of that blade shape, things um, where it, it works well in a pinch grip and it works well uh, you know, choked up pinch grip um, and it's just so good at utility cuts. I knew when I saw this, which has the same kind of qualities, but this hollow grind. <laughs> this immediately was like, okay, I don't need, I don't need that anymore. I don't need the uh, the whippersnapper anymore. If I'm if I'm gonna be able to get this. I am all over the place in my head. One of the things that's so freaking cool about this is that this is being hard milled at 61 to 62 HRC. So this is 20 CV and almost no one, absolutely almost nobody is doing that in the, in the industry right now. And it's so freaking cool to see that being done. And so the reason for that kind of process is to be able to get a blade that is this insanely thin. How am I even going to be able to show you how thin this is? This is absurdly thin this whole way if you, uh, most people will do their grinding or their milling of the bevel before heat treat that way they can do it and so, uh, do soft milling and it's it's easier to do soft milling it takes less time and it does a lot less tool wear but the problem is is if you do it that in that order you can't make this thin of a blade because if you did make it this thin it would warp during heat treat and so what people normally do is just not grind as thin of a blade and then do their heat treat after very few people are willing to try this and because the result is that it has that additional tool wear and everything like that. It just takes longer. It's a harder process. And, and a lot of people just honestly don't think that they can. Knife industry hasn't really evolved in terms of the, the general steps of knife making all that much. And so it's only young, ambitious guys like this that are willing to do it in this reverse order. But the result is, oh my freaking God, then this is such a freaking cool hollow grind. This stays so insanely thin for so incredibly long. This is going to be such an absolutely wildly insane slicer. I chose to go for a stone wash finish and it came out looking so beautiful. And the funny thing is, is that, uh, he, like I said, he's, he's a super perfectionist and he ended up redoing this blade for my knife, like multiple times, three, four, five times, something like that. It's crazy um, because every single time he was uh, evolving how he was doing his tool pass and everything as he went. And so he wanted to make sure that the finish of this came across correct. And then he was finding ever so slight tool marks left over from earlier runs. Um, uh, after after tumbling and everything like that. And so yeah, he's the type of perfectionist that's willing to redo the blade entirely rather than um, than give out something that is has the ever most slightest imperfection. Um, man, this is so freaking cool. So this is uh, 125,000 blade stock. And like I said, this comes out so freaking razor thin out here that this is going to be just an absolutely insane slicer. Up here, we've got this opening hole. We've got a top swedge that thins it out. It does get a little bit thicker right there. And so if you do curl up and put your finger right there, there's a little bit of a thicker spot for you to put uh, weight onto if you're doing a lot of force. There's really unique jimping. This goes along with his triaxis logo. He's got the three lines going up at an angle. And so his jimping is done here at an angle. It's, ooh, oh yeah, I love it. So this is, yeah, this is like perfect jimping. This is the kind of jimping that is shallow, but crisp. And as a result, you, you, this, oh, oh yes, I love it. You, it doesn't hurt at all to slide your thumb over. It doesn't hurt at all to push on it, but it absolutely locks you in. Oh, this feels so good in my hand. This is a incredibly thin handle. This entire thing is only um, 0.388 inches and it is so wildly skeletonized inside. Let's see if I can bounce some light up to get up in here. 
I'm going to have to take this apart to be able to truly show just how skeletonized this is. Because it is like practically empty in there. But unlike some folks who have done a just like a one giant hollowed out pocket he keeps in this lattice structure as he goes which gives him the same kind of weight reduction but gives it a lot more stability as he goes and one of the things i was talking with him about is like he again super perfectionist super dialed in um he he tried a whole bunch of different depths of how much material he would actually leave in and he could get it even lighter he said um and and it still was very very sturdy and strong but this is what he thought would be a sweet spot in terms of of weight and this entire thing is only three ounces uh th i think he quotes it at 3.05 and yes i think he has absolutely nailed the weight on this this is uh, just over three inch blade but with this finger toil we're talking about i think it's two and a half inches of sharpened blade and so where's my balance point on this oh yes it is exactly where you want it to be. It is exactly right there in the finger toil, which is why this feels so freaking nimble in my hand. Okay, one of the things that this, uh, that this, that action, one of the things that he did for me on this, um, that is a, a, uh, a first for the Midnight series is he normally has a lanyard hole right here. And that's one of the things that I think makes it look even more like a, uh, a whippersnapper because it had a similar style of lanyard hole in the back. It's kind of a, an angle or angular shape. Let me get that out real quick. Yeah. Something kind of similar to that. Um, and I said that I'm not a lanyard guy and asked if he'd be willing to drop the lanyard hole. But then I started asking him about, you know, weight balancing and everything like that. And I asked if he would, um, I, you know, how, how he thought it would impact the overall balance. And he's, it's an incredibly small amount of material that we're leaving off. But he went a step further and turned the inside, what would have been the lanyard hole, into a pocket that matches the same depth of, 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 um, of, weight relief as the internal skeletonization. And so the end result is that there's only the tiniest bit of additional metal right there. And so the weight balance is going to be exactly spot on. One of the other things that he did um, that is uh, a, a first for the Midnight series is I said I am a uh, sterile knife person. And normally this says the word midnight. I think it's written right here, midnight. And so I asked if he would put that on the inside instead. Let's see if we can find where that is. It's right here on the lock bar. Are you going to be able to see this? Let's get some light up in here again. Oof, I don't, there, okay, you can kind of see it. Yeah, I don't know how well you're going to be able to read that, but that says midnight, and it says triaxis, and it says the date of production in there, and it says that it's number 13, and there's a little logo, and so normally... Normally that is going to be on the on the on the back. So it's really cool of him to accommodate that for me. Um, the other thing that there was a, a first for the series uh, is, that I I had him do is to do this milling pattern on the back. So let's finally talk about this milling pattern. This is what he calls his Musgrave milling pattern, and it's named that because it's named after the source of this pattern itself. This uh, he made this using the Musgrave texture in Blender, and I in a in a like a design flow that I can so Im immensely empathize with this like how many tools can you chain together thing he made the texture in blender exported it imported it into inkscape reduced the the like polygon count or node count uh, exported that as an svg imported that into fusion and turned that into a blade path but what is a musgrave texture i think this is so incredibly cool looking it's named after ken musgrave and he's a computer scientist and he was a professor at george washington university the reason why he's kind of famous is because he was one of the original people to write um to work with like fractal generative um, patterns. I am a huge nerd what about when it comes to to like computer generated natural patterns. And so like these kind of organic growth patterns that you'll find, I have a whole bunch of jigsaw puzzles that are all done in the same kind of way where like the shape of the puzzles has been organically grown um, using an algorithm. And so Ken Musgrave wrote these algorithms to do France, uh, fractal based landscape topography generation. And it's like kind of the formative work in that area that has been used to do the kind of landscape generation and topography patterns from that point forward. And so this, I, I love, I, I love topo patterns. I love fractal patterns. I love 
like computer generated natural patterns. And so I loved that this existed as an option. Um, and I also just love that it is named after that guy because I'm I'm a I'm a computer nerd and I love this stuff. And so he had done this for the show side, but he hadn't yet come up with a comparable pattern that would work on the scales and the, the clip side. And oh, I love how this came out. So uh, in terms of uh, the color and everything like that. I said I wanted this to be stonewashed on the outside, but I wanted, I chose to pick a green. And I, there's just, there's just not much green in the knife world. It's one of my absolute favorite colors. And so I, 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 I thought like, you know, when I showed off, I mocked up what I thought it would look like in Photoshop. I'll pop in what I, what I thought it would look like, um, based on previous ones. I modified the colors and filled this in and all that kind of stuff. And, um, I'll see how it compares to this. But I sent that off to a bunch of, uh, a friends of mine saying like, oh my God, I just bought this book spot. And the general reaction I got from almost everyone is, are you sure about the color you chose? <laughs> and yes, I'm absolutely sure uh, because I love green and um, it's just so hard to find. And so I talked with him about what color green exactly I wanted. And this is something that's gonna be up in the roughly 93 to 95 volt range. I said that I wanted it to lean more uh, blue than yellow if it had to. And I think this is absolutely perfect. This is hitting, I don't, I think my camera is picking this up as teal. I'll try and uh, Photoshop in an image that, that captures it correctly. But in real life, this is pretty much, I would say maybe like a Kelly green as, as is. But as we saw at the beginning, he talks about how um, the way anodization works is that if you, if you have oil on it of any kind, or if you clean it to varying with different kinds of um, solvents that it will refract light in a slightly different way and become a little bit darker or become a little bit brighter. Uh, I, I could not be happier with the way that this turned out. And the way he, even this is the kind of thing where he is such a perfectionist that he re anode this. I think he said like two or three times because the, he, you, you anno it and then you tumble it in order to be able to tumble off the outside, but leave the anno on the inside. And he said that he noticed small little scratches that got into the, uh, the milling part. Um, and so he wanted to make sure that it came out exactly perfect for me. I, I, I adore the amount of att you know, um, attention to detail and it's like, effort put in to make this come out exactly perfect. Um, the the pattern itself is milled in with a 1 32nd inch ball mill. And yeah, so you get this really cool thing where it is slightly textured in. You can you can feel it with your fingernail and the anno is only in there and not on the outside. And I don't normally go for anno knives. And so I was, some people, some of my friends were surprised that I chose um, anodization at all for a custom build. But this, uh, having the anno just on the inside means that this is very unlikely to get get scratched because it would have to get perfectly into these tiny little 1 32nd inch channel to scratch it at all. Any kind of wear is just going to end up on the surface and just blend in with the stone wash that I had him do. Um, even if this did get scratched, and here's the thing, like I said that he redid this several times because he noticed a small scratch. Even if this did get scratched, this kind of pattern is so intentionally busy and textural that I don't think it would show any kind of wear anyway. And I purposely went with, for this being stonewashed and this stuff all being stonewashed. And so I think this is, uh, I can't get over that, going to be a, a knife that I do not at all hesitate to use. Let's, let's move on to some other cool stuff that he's doing. You'll notice that uh, <laughs> oh, one of the things he's doing here, can I actually show this? Let's see. Let's see if I can sh zoom in. Let's see if I can bounce some light up and zoom in enough to make this visible. What's going on right here is this lock bar insert has this this nub sitting up here in front of. So this is a a detent ball, a ceramic detent ball that has had the top uh, shaved off to make it a plateau, and then there is this like nub in the titanium that's sitting in front of it. And that is the same kind of approach that you'll find on something like the Gen 2 version of the Grimsmo Rask. And so this, this lockup is going to be very, very similar in terms of how that works. And what that means is that there is no such thing as a detent... Sorry about that. No such thing as a detent engagement point. Like there is no point where this is closing but not on the detent ball yet because that nub extends all the way up to the edge. It does mean that you have to push this over all the way to clear that. Like you have to push it over a little bit more than you would. You might think that you'd be able to get right there and st start opening it, but what but that 
is actually not past the nub yet. So it's right there. And so this is the kind of thing where similar to something like a, uh, a Sebenza 31 or something where it has the detent ball as the, the actual engagement point itself, or similar to the original version of the Rosie, they were doing the same thing, or in this one where it's like, there's, it's almost impossible to have this not just uh, be up onto the detent ball when you're closing it. This is the exact same thing. It literally is impossible to get this up into the closed position and have it not already been away in a state where it can just fall home. I can't get over how well that's working out. So they, he's polishing the tops of that in a way, and then because of the the general geometry and then the this the light strength of this lock bar, the moment you have this at all closed is in a state where gravity can make it completely free fall. That is so freaking cool. Man, that's cool. I love the fact that he has the um, lock bar relief milled onto the inside, and so you get this clean aesthetic here. This is an interesting choice right now, that the fact that the, the uh, clip is entirely over the lock bar. Now, sometimes on frame locks, the, the way that the clip will be made is, uh, is bent down in a way that is pressing on the lock bar when it's open. And that would mean it would cause additional uh, pressure on the lock bar, which would make it harder to, to open up the knife. You can see that this is not the case here, that this is actually floating above it when it's in this opened up locked position, which means if you squeeze it, yeah, you do feel a little bit of flex. I'm literally flexing this down. In the open, I mean, the closed position, you can see that it actually is floating above the frame. I don't know how this is going to work in practice. I don't know if this is going to be enough tension here for it to feel like it's sliding in and not going to slide out of my pocket. I'll, I'll, I'll update you guys as I go, but it's an interesting choice either way. And that's one of the very first, like the few things that I would say, maybe I would encourage him to keep this material here going down further to make this be more flush or at least uh, less of a gap when it is um, when it's in your pocket. But this pocket clip in general is something that we, we just, I'm so, yeah, uh, is something we just have to talk about because this is one of the most bizarre and complicated and amazing pocket clips I've ever seen. So right off the bat, let's see how much, what our, our carry is like, because this is going to carry right about there. <laughs> oh, this is exactly the kind of nerdery that I adore. This is, I would go as far as to say over-engineered, and I say that with the most like love in my heart that I can, um, a pocket clip I've ever seen. This is so freaking cool. This is a like five axis milled pocket clip that is completely flush. It is totally hidden hardware and it's hidden hardware in a way that I've never seen anyone else do. But the result is that you get this like super freaking deep carry yet 3D mill clip. I, I can't see exactly what it's saying up in there, but if we look, we can see that it also says stuff under there. Okay. We've got uh, textural milling right there. I wonder if that extends all the way up. Oh, there's a little hole right there. We have textual milling right there. We've got the Triaxis logo. And what does that actually say? I can't quite read it. I will figure that out afterward. I think it says something. Maybe it says USA. I don't know. I'll figure out what that is and put it in. I, I I can't read it because I'm trying to look at my camera screen. If I if I had it up, I'd just be able to put it up to my eye and be able to read it. But let's finally talk about how this hidden hardware works, and we'll get into why this is coming in. Because the way that this attaches is via a screw right there. Am I going to be able to show that? There is a screw right there. Can I get the light to shine on it? Yeah, okay, you can see it. There's a screw right there. Well, how the hell do you get to that? Well, there's this hole right here. And this is one of the things when I was looking at the pictures, it hadn't clicked to me because I hadn't actually stumbled upon how it, one of the Instagram stories you shows where this works. What the heck this hole actually is doing? This hole is how you get this screwdriver in right there and into that screw. <laughs> This is absolutely bonkers. What a freaking crazy way of doing this. So you you slide this screwdriver 
in through the backspacer and get at that screw in order to be able to take this screw out and, and be able to remove the pocket clip. I, I've never heard of anyone doing anything like that. One of the things that makes that incredibly cool is that it's changing the axis on which the screw is actually going in. Like every other... Can you, can you think of a single knife you've encountered where the screws weren't going into the plane of the knife? Like every single screw is going into the plane on every knife ever. And this is going along the plane of the knife. That's just a 90 degree angle swap. It's just like, it's not... I'm not going to say that's like better or worse or anything. It's just it's just a really strange novel way of doing it. I have seen some custom makers, the kinds of custom makers that are making true hidden hardware knives where there's not a single piece of visible hidden hardware. They'll come up with really complicated ways of making an internal screw that's going that way. And that's the only place that I've I've ever seen anyone do that. And so it's just oh, it's just such a freaking wild and crazy way of approaching this. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Man, okay, so this lock bar is really, really, really easy to open up. We've got um, a chamfer here, and we've got uh, a recessed part here. It allows us to push on that. This is going to be that's so easy to push over. The action is so good. I love that. So everything about this is made in house except for these little screws. There's there's um, tiny screws right there holding the lock bar in, and these. Uh, three screws, the one holding the clip in. Those small screws are things that he outsourced, uh, but everything else is something he's making completely himself in-house, including the pivot. You'll see that this is my favorite kind of captive pivot, where there's something about the shape of the pivot itself that prevents it from spinning. And I love that. I love that so much more than like a D-shaped barrel or something like that. I also love that the shape of this mirrors the, the angularity of the handle here and the angle there. It all just super cool. This is, he, um, in addition to a CNC, he has a lathe. And so he is making the threading on these screws, uh, a tighter threading than you normally find on pivot screws. I believe he said it's a, a 664 threading, and that allows you to get an even more fine tune adjustment on this. I, I just, every, across, I, <laughs> I can't even finish sentence this. Every single little detail about this is the kind of thing that is just like wildly, uh, engineered, uh, almost over-engineered, uh, wildly thought out, wildly small details. I, I just, I can't get over it. This is so freaking cool. You can, he's got skeletonization up here even. Oh my gosh, this, this is crazy cool. I'm so bad at the kind of thumb flicking. I wish I was better at that, but I suck at thumb flicking whole knives. This isn't hard to do. I, I compared to other ones, uh, I'm just, yeah, that's, that's easy to do. I just always have to get it in my hand in a way that I'm not used to. But this is definitely going to be a reverse flick knife for me. Okay. In terms of thickness, we are talking even thinner than a rosy. I think this is actually going to be something that feels very similar to a rask. I've never handled a rask, but the rask, I believe, is 0.39, and this is 0.388, and so that's also really heavily skeletonized. And so this same kind of like super thin, very light, ultra high uh, finishing and everything like that, and because it has the same kind of uh, lock bar insert and action with the drop shot, this this feels like if a rask and a whippersnapper had a baby. And I, <laughs> that is, just makes it such an incredibly mean knife. This angle here at the back fits into my palm really, really nicely to be able to hold it in this kind of pinch grip. And if I choke up even further, then this just lines up right there. Ah, oh, I, I think, I think this is incredible. I think the machining here is impeccable. Every single little bit of finishing is so incredibly carefully well done. This is just bonkers. Okay, yeah, let's go ahead and take this thing apart because I just, I want to see what's inside. Uh, I believe everything is going to be T8s because um, that's the tool he came with. Wow, is a nice deep T8 that he did there. Um, and, and you'll notice right off the bat, like I was saying, why he had to include this. Because a lot of drivers won't be able to fit into this thing. And so you need a long, thin driver that can fit all the way down in here. Now, I actually own this literal exact one already as part of a set. These are also super easy to come by if you and things that are comparable. And so it's not the kind of thing where like, 
It's not the kind of thing where it's like proprietary in any kind of way, but that is something to note. You won't be able to fully disassemble this until you have, unless you have one of these long ones. Um, also, it's also just crazy to think about milling this because if you think about the, the 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 hole that he has to make, he has to make this incredibly long, very thin hole right here. And so, just from like a like a perspective of of a bit that's not going to break off. Okay, let's see if we can get this in here. I think this is probably the most precarious part of taking this apart. Um, trying to get this to sit in there right. There we go. So that's, there we go. Now I have no idea what order I was supposed to take this out in, but you can see we are there. And let's now get this back out. I am like literally wedged in that screw. What have I done? There we go. So will that screw just come out now? Oh, this entire thing just comes off at that point. Oh my gosh, that's nuts. <laughs> Is this the cool kids club? <laughs> okay, that's nice and fun. Man, this is such a crazy backspacer. You can see he's got two little pins right there. Man, okay, so that just came right out. Then let's, uh, I guess, close this. Let's get our screw out. I can hurt it fall around. It's a tiny little screw. Let's close this and take apart the rest of this. I'm gonna switch over to my regular driver from this point because it's just gonna be a little bit easier to turn. Yeah, you can look at the threading on that. Oof, that is nice. Okay. Are these the same size and shape? They are not, so I'll have to keep those separate. But I imagine this one over here is the same size. Yeah, those look the same. But I'll keep them separate just in case. Now at this point, I imagine this entire thing is just, yep, it immediately comes off. <laughs> oh, look at this. This is so freaking cool. So here you can see the side effect of the anodization. So this internal part is not um, getting tumbled away, just, just like the inside of this milling path here. And so this is... Um, the color that this is ends up after all the different times he had to anodize it. You can see right here we have our triaxis and it says midnight. Like I said, it was that's normally written on the uh, backspacer, but he put it in here for me. This particular one is number thirteen, and it was started on four eighteen twenty twenty two, and uh, that's pretty close. That's generally around my birthday too, so that's kind of cool. Um, what up here? This is the you know, the steel type, so this is seventeen four. Um, H900 steel. That's a, a type of hardened stainless steel that uh, they're using for the lock face. And that's this is the kind of small details nerd that is willing to tell you what his, uh, not just tell you, but engrave onto it what his uh, lock bar insert um, steel is. So let's zoom in and take a look at this lock bar insert front. You can see that the flattened off detent ball, which is a ceramic detent ball, is sitting in a column that's part of the lock bar itself, and then it's completely surrounded by the insert. And then there is this nub right at the front that is slightly rounded down to act as a very mild ramp that extends all the way up to the detent ball. And it is just sitting below the height of this. So like, if we look at this height this way, it's going to be just short of that. And so there is no step up on like it, it's so incredibly effortless to to go up from this onto that. But it doesn't mean that you have to clear this part right here in the first place. You can't just clear this, right? You can't clear, just clear this edge. You have to clear this additional little ramp. But that's how they're getting that incredible, like all at once um, open and close feeling. What else we got going on? This over here, let's slide this out. The, these are appear to be uh, Delrin caged bearings. I don't know if these are from TIE Connector. They probably are. I don't, maybe he makes them in-house. I don't think I've ever seen him talk about making them in-house. But over here, we have the the this hole milled out, and that hole is designed to sh fit the shape of that little column and the detent ball itself. So the entire thing has to hide into the blade in order to snap into place. Normally there's just a detent hole, but he had to leave room for that whole column as well. That's so freaking cool to see. You can see we've got our blade steel marked right there, 20 CV. This backspacer is absolutely bonkers. Um, I'm, I don't normally 
take out uh, a backspacer if it's not necessary for disassembling, but I want to show you just how incredibly complicated and cool this backspacer is. Yeah, look at this freaking thing. This is absolutely bonkers. Who designs a backspacer like this? So this is multi-axis milled, so it's being milled from a bunch of different ways in order to be able to get all of these different shapes everywhere. We've got this very thin spot right here that's cut in, all of these little posts that stick up for for um, positioning it in, keeping it centered and everything like that. We've got our channel that we had to drill through this part. And so this shows you right here what this would look like if we had a lanyard. So the lanyard hole would be right there, and this would go all the way through it like that. So that would have been a lanyard hole at the back of the knife. But like I said, he turned it into a pocket that is the same depth as this for me. So this slides through this to reach that hole right there. And to make these things all be perfectly lined up, he had, a, he had to drill this out with a bit that is long enough and thin enough to do this. Ah, oh, this is just freaking bonkers. This is such a crazy knife. I, oh man, I'm just blown away. Um, but otherwise, there's not a whole lot going on in here, you know? Like, this is a this, this is similar to the Rask in the way, or in the Grimm's Mose in the way, where it's like, it's not a complicated knife when it comes to the, the concepts. There's only the same number of kind of moving parts you would find elsewhere. It's the implementation of those concepts. It's just how absurdly skeletonized this is, but with this really amazing lattice structure inside. It's how insanely complicated this is in terms of from, from a machining perspective. It's how insanely complicated this is from a machining perspective that he's taking this not just to the level that Grimsmo is doing, but is significantly beyond, I would say. This is... This is insanity, and I love it to death. And so, whew, this is freaking cool. Um, he makes all of these things himself. These are like the stop pins. You can see the videos of him um, um, cutting them on the lathe. Uh, all of these bits are completely made in-house. It's just... <laughs> This is such a me knife. I absolutely adore this. Okay, um, I do notice that the uh, bearings are riding directly on the tie. That's a little bit surprising to see. I kind of was expecting there to be a, uh, a hardened steel washer in there. I don't think it really matters. And I, I know that having um, the the washer in there would add additional um, thickness there. I mean, they're, they're, I've seen some custom makers, but take the ones from, say, uh, alpha knife supply and flatten them even thinner to make it the tolerance is smaller. Um, sorry, not the tolerance is the the to make the overall stacked width of everything smaller. But yeah, I don't know. So it, by having it go directly onto the tie, you can see it's wearing a path in there. Um, I don't, I don't think it really matters, but it is the kind of thing that I I kind of was expecting to see, given how insanely thought out everything else is. But I'm guessing if I asked him, his opinion is probably that it doesn't matter. You can see that right here there is this hole, and that hole has a threaded screw bit into it. And what's going on here is my assumption, because if you think about how many times they would need to change the shape, the positioning of this, and mount it somewhere to be able to mill in all these different directions, that this is going to be a a, um, a fixturing uh, mount position where he's able to attach uh, a, a way of clamping this in an exactly known place um, in order to be able to make... Oh man, look at that. Look at that tiny little threading there. This is all just freaking crazy. Oh, I have uh, rambled for just too long. This is also one of my least coherent videos. I think I'm just so blown away by all of the absurdity of all of this that I'm having a difficult time just like articulating <laughs> because it's overwhelming to the brain how much bonkers coolness is going on in here. Um, this is interesting to see. There's these little tiny divot points right there and there. What's going on with that? Does that go into a corresponding spot over here? Oh, interesting. That is a washer? Is that a washer? I assume that's a washer. Yeah, weird. I'm going to ask him about that. This appears to be a very thin tiny phosphor bronze washer that is for some reason on the outside. And this has little grooves. This actually looks very similar to the way that Civivi does their captive pivots, but this is the screw side, not the pivot itself. The pivot is captive because of that. I wonder what that's about. 
I wonder why it's shaped like that. The, the, one of the things that I love about John is that he is the kind of huge nerd that is willing to just go into exhaustive long detail for you and nerd out as much as you want. And so I will ask him about all of these things and I am 100% confident he will give me a very thorough answer. So that's really cool to see. Um, yeah, okay. Well, I think I'm going to cut this off and we'll pop back up. So I originally wasn't going to film the uh, reassembly of this because I figured it would just be an inverse of what I did to take it apart, but I realized there's an order of operations problem because if you get it to this point, if you put in all of these pieces, then how do you get this back in? <laughs> because you have to stick this through here, but how do you get the 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 screw into the right spot to be able to put that in? I, I You have to do it, you have to do it with this scale off. So I just took those back out and let's see if we can figure out how to do this. Can I put this clip on first and then slide that in underneath? Or can I get this screw in I'm not sure I don't know I don't know I honestly don't know what's going to be the right order here I think I probably need to like put this part way in and then fit this onto here and then try and like get it started maybe I don't have it on there centered correctly okay maybe if I do that maybe if I just leave it there I don't know. What happens if I put this in first? Which I'm doing this with my non-dominant hand. I should flip this entire thing over. Okay. So now we have the clip on. It's such a tight threading on this. These I don't know where he's getting these made since he said these are, are not done in-house, but they are exceptional screws. They have some of the best engagement on this little Torx driver. Anyway, um, now let's see. Is it possible to then slide this in underneath? Is that how you do this? Maybe. Not quite lining up. But I think yes, I think I can get this in. I've gotta get this backspacer pin in. There's probably a much more obvious order of operations to do this in. <laughs> okay, maybe not. Uh, the difficulty I'm running into is getting this pin into that hole with this kind of cocked at an angle. Yeah, this can't be how I'm supposed to do this. Okay, so what if I screw, what if I, like, I, I unscrew this, but leave it mostly in the right spot? I think that maybe makes more sense. So now I'm going to take that out, pinch that there. Okay, so now what I'm doing is just, like, going to insert this screw into this hole and hope that it stays there. Like that. I don't know. Now I can put this on. Line up this back pin, line up that pin, put these in. So now if I shake this, I'm going to lose my screw, but right now it is sitting right there. So what I'm going to do is insert this and try and hold it into place. Got to get this lined up. Okay, I'm on. So now, theoretically, I can push this back out just a little bit, push this down on, and there we are. Hey oh <laughs> let me make sure that's tight. Wiggle that back out. Now pop this up on, push this down, put that on. Let me make sure these are tight. Okay, we have reassembled the knife. Centering is hard to see because the way this back frame is done, but it's dead on. How is our action? Absolutely guillotine. How is our lockup? Absolutely rock solid. Okay, we did it. <laughs> it was a little bit of a puzzle. I don't know if there's an even more sensible order of operations to do that, but so far I think the trick is to align the screw as if it's in there, put those back on, engage the thing, and do it in that order. And we're back to having the knife. Oh my god, that's so freaking good. Okay, and so... I think that if you are in the market, uh, if you are in the kind of market that you could, you're looking to get a Rosie or you're looking to get a Rask or something else from Grimsmo, I think you have to look at this. This is going to be probably the best performing of any of these. Like this is the, the Rosie is exceptionally thin and a very, very, very good slicer. But this is this insanely tall 
uh, hollow grind. He grinds this at at the angle on the on the machine, and the, it makes it so that he can actually come in a, a steeper and taller uh, and like deeper hollow grind than you would be able to do with a traditional hollow grind, which is done on like a, a barrel grinder of some kind. And so this is like a like a even more exaggerated, amazing hollow grind. This is the kind of thing where this is going to be even taller and um, thinner for longer than on like one of those burgers that I rave about. So if you are in this space, and I, I think you just have to take a look at this, you have to try this out. This is just so freaking cool. The one thing that I think is going to hold this back from being the next Rosie is that I think the 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 shape when closed is going to look weird enough with this what appears to be blade to handle ratio that I think some people are going to go like, I think it looks too weird for me. I personally love the way this looks. I love the fact that it is weird and I love weird things, but I think it's probably a, just a smidge a little out there. And whereas something like this is just so quintessentially knife, this is the kind of thing that everybody is going to find attractive enough to want to get in on it. And this is the kind of thing that um, I think you have to be a little bit more adventurous to be able to to want to get into it. But you know, the Alamics are are very popular. People freaking love the Whippersnapper, and that's a way weirder looking knife. Than, well, even more weirder looking knife than this. And so I think, I think this is going to be huge. I think John is going to be absolutely huge. And he's at the very beginning. This is the 13th one he's made. He's made... Um, I think 16 now at this point. I, I think in a year from now, everyone's going to know what this knife is and everyone is going to know John. <laughs> and so I'm very, very excited to have gotten in at the very beginning of this. I'm mostly just very excited to have this knife. I am so incredibly excited with how this has come out. Um, I can't get over it. Okay, I have been rambling now for close to 40 minutes. Um, I will do a full disassembly at some point because I want to show you up inside. I don't know if I'll edit that into this video or not, uh, but yeah, this is amazing. Okay, thank you guys for watching and I'll catch you guys next time.